He's like a he's a lovable clown, you know. Yeah. I guess yeah. I don't want to make it sound like I don't take him seriously, but I don't know. Do I? Don't I? Does he well, want to be? So you have I'm Easy, but then the song after that kind of, you know, throws a curve. Alex Heward. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to talk about this gentleman here? Oh, wow. He's so pretty. It's Diamond Dave. Wow. Oh. In oh. the flesh. Who do you think it was? I thought it was Lita Ford. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David Lee Roth, Diamond Dave. Yeah, that's what we're here talking about. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, look at that. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Can you guess? Don't show the face. Don't show the face. Just the hair. Guess. That's actually. Funny. Guess who it is? Is that? Yeah. Is that? No, you can't really. <laughs> well, I just it's have to. Come like up Jenny the front. Lee Harrison from Three's Company. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't know that one. That's. But... that's yeah, that's like a. You're too young for that. <laughs> However. Oh. Look at that oh, spread. Wow. Up higher. Up higher. Up a little higher. Oh, yeah. Look at go. that. How about that? Wow. This is obviously Kerrang. And Kerrang. Uh, this came out in August of 1986 after uh, the record in question this evening was released. The hard rock album, Eat em and Smile. This little number right here. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. Diamond Dave. Diamond Dave, double D. Double D. <laughs> hey, check this out. Yeah. What's Speaking up? Speaking of uh, 80s risque. Oh, whoa. What yeah. is that? Well, you Holy tell me. Holy smokes. Can you show that? Is that allowed? Doesn't leave. What, do you want to see it again? No, I was. <laughs> no, 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 no. My parents watched the show, okay? Not leave. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We'll keep it PG. We'll keep it PG. Not leaving much to the imagination there. Oh, that's cool. I want to see the box of all your cassettes, you know? I keep upping the ante. I keep on like, hey, show me your cassette. Now I'm like, now I'm like, show me the box. They're all, all like over them. there. They're yeah. all, in, a, they're all in, in this like faux kind of wood paneling thing. It's kind of funny. That's... That was like, you thought nothing of it in the 80s because it was like cool. But I was you look at say... it now and you're like, that's so dumb. Did you make the box out of the wood paneling in your mother's house? Is that was that where it came from? Uh, no. What <laughs> was there? No wood paneling she had in, throughout the house. Oh, when I was young in the basement, yeah, in, yeah. The, in the in the what they called the rec room. Yeah, it of was, course. Uh, it was that goofy wood paneling for sure. The wood paneling. Yeah, that's why I was. It was like you this. Made... It was like this thin. Yeah. And it yeah. looked like it was like uh, what do they call that? I can't remember the. There's a, there's a name for it. And well, there was parquet just, flooring, but uh, what is no. the wood? What is the wood? The wood paneling? Was, I don't know. Like it was wood goofy. paneling. You just like nailed it to the wall and right particle board. That's it. That's it. Was it? It was particle board. It? Yeah. Oh wow. Very similar. Anyway, if it's not, yeah. Super cost effective. Hmm. Yeah, and then your house so, burned down. Yeah. Oh. Tinderbox. So many good memories of that. My my family live in the Sioux, Sioux Saint Marie. It's where my 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 nana and papa live. My dad's side of the family, and uh, right. that whole basement was just it's like wood paneling, Same. floral couches. They're also Italian. Oh so yeah, we have like, that too. It's perfect, man. That's like that's like I, that's... I that's what I want houses to look like now. Oh you know? God, dude! Really? I want to go back. I want to go back. Take me back. I was there, and I don't want to go back. <laughs> It's not a good okay. look. Were, well, okay. Imagine Maybe the you walls little... back here just being that paneling. I'd love it. I would love it. I would be at your house every weekend. And shag carpet on the floor. Oh, my God. You know what I love? You know like, what would be so cool? <clears throat> is like I, I've always wanted one of these. You know in those L.A. homes where it's like you have like this, this step down into mm -hmm. like a seating area? Yeah. That is friggin' cool. That's what I want. I want to step down into a seating area. So, so I was at uh, a house a couple of weeks ago at a party and the guy bought this house and 
before he moved in, he bought the house, but he knew he was going to have to renovate. So in the house, like you, you went, you, you came in the front door and you walked through the house and then you went down into this really cool kind of, you know, there's like five steps down and it was like almost like a receiving area, but it wow. went that way and this way and the huge like windows and stuff like that. But over here was, believe it or not, a heart shaped cherry red hot tub wow. built into the floor. What? Yeah. Yeah. And the ceilings were vaulted. So you went down the ceiling height stayed the same. So when you were there, you looked up and you could see the master bedroom. There was like French doors. So like you who built this house? You didn't tell me you were friends with Hugh Hafner, man. Come on. <laughs> that's sort of no, Larry Flint. Larry Flint. That's yeah. That's the other, the other one. The other the, one, the, the dirtier one. Nice. Yeah, the dirtier one. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. You know what? The, the what? word word of the word of this span, nostalgic equity. That's mm. that is the phrase. That is the phrase of these last few That's albums. True. And I have a feeling I have a feeling it's gonna carry on with, with David Lee Roth's Eat 'em and Smile, Brent. Your feeling is quite accurate. Yeah. This was Well, you know what though? We'll, we'll get into this, but this was probably one of the most listened to records in my collection in the eighties. Wow! No, mm. really? For real? Holy yep. smokes! It was okay. just light. It was fun. It's a fun record. All right, all right. So, what about fifty-one fifty? No, nothing. Didn't buy it. Didn't want it. Oh. Here's the thing about that. Oh. Okay, and this That's is so why wild. I wanted to talk about this record. Okay, because never before was it so evident that David Lee Roth was the entertainer in Van Halen and Eddie Van Halen was the technician. You kind of like literally had to make a choice. Yeah. And I, and I, 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 I remember this clear as day when I read on, I think it was circus magazine said David Lee Roth leaving Van Halen. And I was like, Oh my God, now what do I do? It was almost like your mom and dad were breaking up, right? <laughs> Hagar love him, but not for Van Halen. Never bought 5150, never bought for unlawful carnal knowledge. Never bought anything. I didn't buy any of those Hagar records, but I bought the Roth records. That's so, that's, I don't know why. I just feel like that's so crazy. Like Eddie is so good. He just like, you just feel like you, you just like, he was, he was lifeblood. And then you realize you're right. Technically, but you know, for the, you kind of realize why you listen to Van Halen. You wanted to hear those solos. Sure. But it, there was a, it was just a fun vibe with, with, with these guys that's what it was that's really yeah. what it was that that kind of x factor and that thing that made women and children fun in 1984 fun was david lee roth yeah you know and people say well he was a clown and he was you know goofy and but still there was kind of a lovability there you know what i mean like he was kind of this schmaltzy showman who was like oh sorry everybody you know and he was kind of <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah but, but yeah. it was entertaining like it yeah. truly was. And I love Eddie Van Halen. One of my favorite guitar players by far. Oh yeah. It has to be. But for him to, you know, introduce more keyboards into the band, by the way, but also write songs like dreams and stuff like that with, with Hagar, it just wasn't the same Van Halen anymore. It wasn't, it kind of lost its identity for me a little bit. And again, I know people are going to get upset with that, but it just wasn't the same. And Roth hanging on to Roth for me, or following Roth, rather, was a better way to hang on to what was Van Halen before than following, you know, Ed with Sammy Hagar. I felt like I was closer to Van Halen with, with David Lee Roth. And I know that that's bizarre and weird to hear, but... And, when, yeah. and, and that that just goes to show you, Alex, like how important a front man is to a band, doesn't it? Completely. Completely. It's 100% it, man. When, when I put this album on... <laughs> <laughs> and Yankee Rose started, man. I was like, <laughs> I was, I was, I was ear to ear, man. I looked like Roth. I was grinning right. ear to ear when this song came on because it was like, wow, wow, what? Here you're like, <laughs> yes, he's back, baby. <laughs> yeah, see, <laughs> yeah, it's like the ultimate showman. I, I, yeah, and I obviously I know this is like just his, the, his second project. Like the EP came out was it Crazy from the Heat? Crazy the from first, the Heat. Was yeah. The first EP. With the EP before this, so I mean, it's not like it was the first thing that was released as David Lee Roth, but you know, it was just like, 
ah, oh, this is this was this what a great way to start it off. And yet you then all of a sudden you feel this like fun, loose fun. energy combined with like Steve Vai obviously is a great guitar player as well. Um, you do notice it's not Eddie. I I will say that, mm. but it's. But it's just it's so complimentary to to Roth because he just knows how to he knows how to play with that and he knows how to he knows how to have fun with with the players and you just that's that you feel that through this album you felt that through obviously Women and Children Van Halen one two you know it just it is he really was just like the lifeblood of of the bands man like he yeah. really was. I think I feel like he was. He was that that fun ethos in Van Halen was mostly attributed to David Lee Roth. You mm-hmm. know, I think. You think you think kind of writing was on the wall though at the very beginning. I mean, like they didn't even want. And this is kind of going back a little bit to the Van Halen stuff, but like you know, can't help but touch on it. But right. from the very beginning, they didn't want Roth in the band. You know, Mm. and he kind of talked his way into it and they were like, all right, fine. And, you know, it was the whole PA thing. They didn't want to run to PA anymore. So they brought him into the band and they didn't even like the Red Ball Jets and the music that they were singing. Like there wasn't a whole lot that really, I think, even from the beginning gelled with the band. And when you kind of look and like learn more about the Van Halens and, you know, what they know about music and the life they came from, it just felt like it was sort of like... It was coming. It was a long time coming from the very beginning, almost. I didn't really feel that like around Van Halen 2 and Women and Children first. And the reason why is because you're right. At first, Roth kind of didn't really seem to fit because people knocked him for not being a proper singer, you know, because Ed was like this virtuoso and the rest of the band was very good, too. And so they said, well, he's kind of the weak link. But then people started to see what he could do as a, a a showman and a band leader as it were and he looked good and this was now we're coming into the 80s right and he had this jim dandy kind of vibe and people were like yeah he's cool like he's a cool guy and then things started to change they're like okay well he's you know i like the way that he kind of delivers a line he's charismatic he's he's diamond dave and then it's like okay we're it's on like dave is the face of van halen you know um, and then around women and children first, then, you know, things started to happen. They, you know, they started to butt heads and stuff like that. And then it started to got dark, right. With fair warning and so forth. Um, but for a while, I, th- you know, Van Halen too, you know, I could see Van Halen or I could see Roth sticking around. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and not to say that there's any, any, you know, uh, evidence during those those obviously those good times of that. I just feel like when you think about back to the very beginning and the way that they didn't really fully mesh, you know, like I, I think right off the the, the hop kind of led to mm. I don't know the personality of David Lee Roth, even even of Eddie, right? Like those are that's just difficult. Roth's personality just seems like he'd be. He's big, right? He's big. He's got this idea. He's oh, yeah. he always had this idea of being big, yeah. and and taking himself to stardom, which he was fully capable of doing, mm-hmm. and did that obviously with the band and with Van Halen. And, um, you know, but he's just had this mindset, right? He had this goal that he wanted to get, and nobody was going to kind of get in his way. And when that happened with Van Halen, he was like. That's it and and it wasn't even really it was a bad breakup right it was it was it was an ugly breakup yeah it was really awful i remember you know hearing snippets of and and some you know tv clips actually because there were press conferences it was a big deal at the time because van halen this was the apex of their commercial success 1984 keep in mind was was at peaked at number two in the billboard top 200 under thriller Right. So Thriller was the one album that kept it from actually being number one. Which Eddie played on. We well, beat, beat it. it. That's but right. Yes, but he was yeah. on it. Yeah. That's kind of funny, that. right? So he, yeah. Like technically it was one and two. <laughs> um, and I think that actually came up in, in the, the arrows that were being slung back and forth. Yeah. Well, they weren't, he, he wasn't a big fan. Like he tried to do that under like raps, play mm. that solo. And Roth heard him. 
he was in like the Amazon or something like that. And he heard the song come in on, on the radio when they were in town or something. And he's like, I recognize that guitar. That's my boy. That's yeah. that's Eddie. What's yeah, he doing? Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a big fan of that. No, sorry. No. Okay. And Ed, Ed was kind of, he was this very good natured guy. He was, Ed was kind of shy and he had this easy disposition where he didn't really trust a lot of people, but he's like, okay. Like he just wanted to be like, a, he was a good guy. And, um, People said, hey, when you play my record, he's like, okay, man. And Roth was like, don't do that. Like, you, you know, Roth is this slickster, right? He's like a business guy. He's like, no, no, no. You, you, know, you play, you get paid, all that stuff. And Ed was like, I don't care. I just like the, you know. Just want to play. Kind of, just want to do ex- this. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. Roth took exception to that. He didn't like that at all. And he thought that Eddie was kind of, you know, not necessarily betraying him, but he didn't mm-hmm. like when he played outside the band. And apparently that was a major point of contention and one of the reasons why Roth left the band. Hmm. Yeah. But Roth also had this movie deal lined up and he was, he was apparently offered by CBS. Is it CBS? Um, Yeah. CBS films. uh, 20 million bucks for the screenplay to crazy from the heat, which with, which Roth had written and submitted and they said, okay, we'll give you 20 million bucks. And he's like, okay, I'm out, I'm out of Van Halen, man. Now I'm in the movies. And he always wanted that. Uh, and then they did a restructuring of the film studio and it just got lost. And here's what I love about that, right? He talked all about that movie deal. He talked all about what they were doing, what it was going to be about, how he was excited about it. They went around town. They went around looking at, you know, scouting. They were casting. Like, this was a big deal for him. He was talking about this was in the press. Yes. And and then it all fell through. And that could have had a huge hit on his ego. But he's friggin' Diamond Dave. And he was just like, all right, well, just we'll go to the album and uh, like yeah, sure it sucked he had these plans but he just he didn't let it phase him he like shrugged this thing off and he came out and put out eat him a smile he was um an interesting character because you know you saw what was diamond dave on the stage and again he was this schmaltzy kind of like carnival <laughs> barker type guy right like hey yeah. um but in in you know behind the scenes there was a little bit of anger and um you know i don't know if you've read his book actually no oh wow look at here. you so this oh. is a fantastic book now when you read this book you will see that there are many sides to david lee roth and this is written by the man himself but there is some like he he there's a little bit of venom in there it's not just all jokey foolishness like he um He's got some anger issues, not significant anger issues, but like he, he doesn't pull punches. It, it, this whole thing is fascinating to me because you know that when, when Roth left, like he was going to come out with all guns blazing, right? Yes. He was pissed and he was like, okay, everybody knows that Eddie Van Halen is the fastest gunslinger in the County, but you know what? I got a guy and wait till you hear my guy. Yeah. And it, that was Steve Vai. <laughs> yeah. And the, the you, you know, kind of the bittersweet thing about that is that vibe blew people's minds. But the, the kind of the, the sad part for Steve Vai is that it was already such a crowded space because Eddie Van Halen in 1977 kind of, you know, had eruption and had started this whole thing, but everybody took to that. And by 1986, you know, the Warren D Martinis and, and, and the Jakey e. Lee's, and everybody else was out there already, as was Steve Vai and uh, Satriani and all those other guys. So it was crowded. So you kind of, his playing is surreal, but there were other surreal players out there too in in a different way than when Van Halen was out there because he was the only guy. Like people were like, holy crap, I cannot believe that this guy can play like that. We should have said that about Steve Vai as well because he is otherworldly. Alex, mm-hmm. if you yeah. watch him play, he had a guitar that was shaped like a heart and there were two fretboards coming out of it. And he played like this, like the things that this guy That's does. Crazy. Yeah. Unbelievable, but didn't yeah. get as much attention because of the time. Well, and, and didn't, uh, his bass player was Billy Sheehan, Billy Sheehan, of, Billy uh, Sheehan, yeah. Billy Sheehan. He was playing with Malmsteen before mm-hmm. coming over mm-hmm. here. 
wasn't he? Was he? He played in a band called Talus. I don't know if he played with Malmsteen. I'm not sure. He was either about to do that or he like either before this project or or yeah, I think ahead of this project he was playing with Malmsteen. Like but then even, even that, right? Like him as a guitar player. Like, like that's a quick interesting side note, you know who he did play with? Max Webster and Kim Mitchell. Very, very briefly, Billy Sheehan was in mm. Max Webster. Wow. It didn't work out, but he he uh, played on a song called Kids in Action. Right. You know the story. Later on, they were recording Eat Him and Smile, and Sheehan called uh, Kim Mitchell on the phone and said, Hey, I'm in the studio with Ted Templeman and David Lee Roth and Steve Vai, and we're going to do Kids in Action. But I don't right. know what the second verse is. So can you give me the lyrics? And Mitchell's like, what? And he goes, is that cool? And Mitchell's like, yeah. <laughs> so and he gave him the lyrics. And apparently they recorded a version of Kids in Action that was supposed to be on Edwin Smile, but it got bumped for Tobacco Road. Ooh. Sean Kelly told me that there is a version of this recorded Kids in Action with David somewhere Roth out there somewhere. Somewhere. It's in a vault. Nobody's ever heard it. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Well, we spent 25 minutes talking about the <laughs> uh, the lead up to the album and everything surrounding it, but um, the tunes, the tunes on this yeah, album. Let's go through. You don't even, you don't even really know what I, you don't even really know what I thought. Sorry. Oh, we you see, you know, it's really funny. The 25 the minutes show, in, you don't even know what I thought. We jumped right into it. We're like, you know, I think in the first minute I asked you what you thought of the record. Yeah. And then now it's like minute 25 and yeah. Asked, yeah. So please, sorry, go ahead. He's like super excited to talk about this record. Yeah. No, uh, no, t- totally. T- I-, I love talking about that stuff uh, beforehand anyways. It's all, it's all part and parcel. Yeah. This was good. This was good. This was good. But good. Like it's, it's a weird feeling with this. It, it's, it's really weird. I, I, okay. I, I enjoy. I love Roth. I love his personality. I love his singing. Um, Yankee Rose, unbelievable kickoff track. But Shy Boy, eh? It, like really? so, there's a couple songs on here that take me back to some like even Van Halen tracks that I'm just like, kind of remind me of some Fair Warning type tracks actually. Mm. So wasn't like a big fan of those i think actually it was elephant gun and and uh and shy boy that i'm kind of like eh. um but uh ultimately really good really good i love how he brought in the you know his influences like loving you know i'm i'm easy and that's life and mm. even tobacco road like mm-hmm. old songs that he just that just suit him so well and that's what I mean about the dynamics of this record versus 5150. So 5150, mm. I, I'm not familiar with the album. I know the singles, but it was a completely different album with completely different goals, I think. And this record has a lot more, even if it's schmaltzy, has to me a lot more personality and it's a lot more fun for that reason with, you know, I'm easy and going crazy because it just feels like, you're invited to the party, you know? And that's the vibe I got from this record. I just thought this is a fun, fun record to listen to. It is. It's totally fun. And just, just briefly on 5150, like they just try, like they just, they just tried right off the bat too hard. Like, Hey, mm. ours introduction. Hello. Baby. Like I just, oh, yeah. like, it's like this, it's just like this, like you're not replacing the guy. It's like in, you know, don't yeah. I don't know. I'm sure they would say it wasn't our intention, but it was like, well, then why are you still trying to have the fun like David mm-hmm. Lee Roth had with mm-hmm. the band? Okay, Sam. So, yeah. anyways, um, yeah, like I said, Yankee Rose kicked off, and I was just so excited. I was so excited, like this, the way that thing started, the talking to the guitar of like this classic, so cool. um, the great chorus, bright lights, city lights. Oh, killer no. man killer yeah. killer kickoff and just uh yeah i love so, it i was excited the video like i i was i was waiting for this to come out and again 
like I had gone through all the, you know, wh- wh- who do I go with Roth or, but yeah. like I knew that this was going to be a super exciting record. Cause I, like yeah. I said, like he, he had an all-star band. Right. Yeah. And it's David Lee Roth and it's 1986. Yeah. So like <laughs> there's no <laughs> limits, you know? No. Yeah. And so the video, I don't know if you've seen the video for this album, but you knew I it didn't. was going to be like outlandish. Right. So it starts right. out in the, in a convenience store. And the stuff that you see in this video, I'm not going to describe it. You would never get away with this now. Yankee okay. Yankee Rose is in in essence a, a take on America, right? It's a tribute to America, but it's also a look at 1986 America, ethnically. Okay. And so there's all this stuff going on with all these characters in. It, this is only like a like a maybe a 45 second kind of bit, but like it's a convenience store and all the people coming through. And then Roth comes in with the makeup that you see here. Like he's made up like that. Oh, wow. And he, he comes up to the cash and he says, uh, what does he say? All of a bottle of anything and a glazed donut to go. And, <laughs> and the video starts. It's like, oh, Diamond Dave awesome. is back, man. This is the coolest yeah. thing ever, right? You watch this on YouTube in 1986? You, you, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, See again, I had to like wait on much <laughs> music until they, you know, were good enough to post the, or to play to post. See, <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's no posting <laughs> to post to, to uh-huh. play this on much music, and I was like thrilled. I could not get enough of it. But I feel like you know, thinking about that now, I feel like this was 1986, and this was as as this was kind of the the penultimate kind of moment for ridiculous kind of hair band stuff this was right under the ceiling of it and like if you took it a little bit further it got ridiculous like roth was just kind of like at the cusp and after this it just got like silly okay got it yeah i didn't feel any i didn't feel any hair metal you know with this i felt like this was just this was like, i hate to say it's just a continuation this was like this is like van halen you know, two point mm-hmm. without Eddie on the guitar, people. Don't worry. I'm just like no Eddie on the guitar. But but it was just like, yeah, like this feels this feels like a fun Van Halen album. Yeah. Folks. Yeah. So it didn't that's what it was. It didn't feel like a Van Halen album for me. It felt like a David Lee Roth record, but like I, I did miss I will admit this, I did miss Eddie's playing. Because like, he's got like a, a number of licks that are instantly recognizable, in addition yeah. to his sound, of course. But like, Mm -hmm. I found myself as a 17 year old kid, almost longing for that. Like I kind of was like, oh, it would be so cool if Ed could just come in and play a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) And again, like, this is how into it we were. Like I was so involved in this record. I made such an emotional commitment to this stuff that I I equated this with the divorce. And I was like, oh my God, which parent do I go with? You know, (laughs) that sucks, man kind of goofy yeah, but that's how it was tough tough yeah um shy shy boy was okay it was kind of like you know, i wasn't a big fan of it i was like yeah it's a little too it's a little kind of yeah i like shy me. boy yeah there's um it's you know. i know you like fair warning so it's fine <laughs> Shine Boy for me is kind of like Hang 'em High almost too. Right? It's just okay. a kind of, you know, good quick clip. Um, there's mm-hmm. a, I, one of my favorite parts on the record, and I don't know why, but the, like to this day, and I was listening to this record today, and again, right around like the two minute 50 second mark, there's a, 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 a whammy bar, kind of what they call a dive bomb. Mm. And it goes, Wow. And it's, you know, Eddie was great with that stuff, but Vi was pretty good too. Okay. And that yeah. moment is, I remember hearing that and going, Ooh, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's yeah. a new gunslinger in town. Yeah. 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 He's got it folks. He's got it too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, no, he's good, man. He's, there's some great, there's some great guitar, guitar fun, great technique. And it's, uh, that's why it just felt so kind of familiar, you know, it felt, felt awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's a little like loss of control too, which is obviously women and children. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a little bit of that that speed that heaviness and speed there was some it, it was it, it's funny because it was a different kind of grit for me like this was really mm-hmm. produced definitely and 
you know, lost control and, and women and children first was really a dirty record. And that's, it, it almost had that stones kind of flavor of dirtiness about it. Right. It was very organic and, and, and ragged. This wasn't ragged for me, but it did have an aggression. But again, that's what I mean about the candy coating. Cause it was kind of like a, a fun aggression. Well, it's just rough on the record, man. I don't know. Like that's it to me. Like Roth singing anything is just candy coated. You mm-hmm. know, that's he's like a he's a lovable clown. You know. Yeah. I guess yeah. I don't want to make it sound like I don't take him seriously, but I don't know. Do I? Don't I? Does he well, want to be? So you have I'm easy, but then the song after that kind of you know throws a curve. Late, ladies Night in Buffalo. Oh right, yeah. Do you get yeah. that too? What did you hear when you when you heard that that song? What did I hear? I don't know. I I was it was a groove, man. Like I, that that's what I got. I was like, okay, he's kind of. It's that's a fair point. That's a fair point. It's it is kind of like buckling up a little bit here. Mm-hmm. You know this this song, yeah. like a little more like matured feel with him. Totally, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. The the music, the singing, yeah. No, right. it was cool. It was almost like there was a, a sentimentality involved, right? And this mm. kind of longing that I I got from it. And it was a little darker than the other tunes. It's almost like Cathedral from um, Diver Down in that like Roth is trying to share something with you that, you know, aside from kind of the clowniness that you usually get, there was like this, uh, I don't know. It was like a, it's in, like, it, it was a longing. There's, there's something about it, you know, it's a serious message. Maybe it's not a serious message, but it's, it's not, you know, the typical carnival barking. Yeah. That, that, I'm easy, that I'm easy, I'm easy, right. baby. <laughs> yeah. But there's like, this, uh, there's, the, yeah, the, it was, it was, it, it was in contrast to the other songs and it really, and still, it's one of my favorite songs from this record. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's good. It is really good. I do, I do like this song. Again, it's got a nice groove to it as well. You're just kind of like, great to hear that. Great to see him get, you know, do a song like this. Yeah. And then going crazy. Money for right. nothing. Isn't it great? Is that what it is? <laughs> Dire Straits. Oh, Money for it? nothing. Oh, interesting. Similar. I was wondering if that guitar opener was sort of inspired by uh, Knopfler there. You know what? You, I think you're onto something there because it's it's um like picking with your thumbs and your fingers, right? Yeah. At the same yeah. time. Yeah. Interesting. It's a great little riff. It didn't. It's a great little riff, but it. Yeah, that just that was what came to my mind when I heard it. I was like, oh, little uh, little money for nothing mm. inspiration here. Yeah. The thing that stands out for me in the song is all the percussion, like the, the cowbells and all the crazy. Mm. You know, I don't even. I think he's got like a bunch of different cowbells that he's hitting. Greg Bissonnette, yeah. the drummer. Yeah. Just yeah. like, it's just, again, it's like just a party, right? It's like yeah. the sun is shining. It's summertime. You're on the water and, yes. you know, the booze is flowing. The music is blasting. And, oh, yeah. You know, we're having the time of our lives. That's what I got oh, from yeah. this. this song, it's exactly what this song is. You know? 100%. Yep. I, that's what I love about it. You know, one thing I was wondering is, like, did what kind of input or direction Roth gave the band members to, to do songs like this. Did, did, did he have any part in being like, this is really fun. I want you to play something like super fun. And you know, like, I don't, I don't know. I'm just kind of was thinking about that listening to this because I feel like he's, he's got a vision. So I was wondering mm-hmm. if, you know, in this, he had like the opportunity to with his name on the album say, okay guys, Here's how I want these these tunes to sound. I don't, I don't know, you know, in particular, um, if there was any directive provided to these guys, but I I I almost think that just his kind of ethos just kind right. of, you know, that's how they got it. They they know, picked it, up on that. Just yeah. hanging around them, you're you can't help but be like it just permeates, yeah. right? It just yeah, it just flows out of him, and they probably picked up on that. And these guys, by the way, were hand selected, right? Not because they were technically skilled, but also because they were, you know, they're fun dudes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, 
Yeah. No. Nope. What it's, a band. It's, uh, yeah. Well, I just think about like Tobacco Road, well, which is next. Tobacco mm. Road, right? Um, before, okay, so before I discovered that this song was a cover, mm. I was like, Roth wrote this. 100%. Like, oh, Tobacco cool. Road, oh, 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 oh. right? I was oh, like, that's, that's Roth. Like that's like, yeah, that's, he would sing. So he would do something like that. Yeah. And then I found out that it was a cover and I was like, that's all right, fine. But he could do something like that. But like he, he, when he, he puts his heart and soul into these covers, right? He does, you know, oh, yeah. crazy from the heat was the same thing. Like, um, just a gigolo, like, mm. yes. uh, yeah, easy street. Like he, he's just, he, He's a showman. He's a performer, yeah. you know, yes. and he gives it his all. And that's why you yeah. think these are his songs because he owns them. With great, great influences, right? Mm. Got great influences. Growing Al Jolson. Too. You know, the thing about Roth too, is that, you know, people take him for that kind of surfer dude, beach blonde dummy, but he's not, he's a super smart guy. And he's, yeah. you, you know, you listen to him in interviews. Like he, he's got all the lines. Like, he, you know, he gives the yeah. best interviews ever. Yeah. But it, that dude knows what's going on. Like, he's totally. extremely bright. Elephant Gun, you mentioned kind of a little bit darker, a little bit, uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Feels a little bit. Love the song. Um, yeah. I don't know, but again, like, you know, it's, there's a, there's an aggression about it, but, like, he keeps it fun. and um, Still, totally. Yeah. That's what's the I, that's the compelling thing about this record for me because there's a little hint of like that aggression, but I don't know. It's light. Big trouble. Best song in the record. This song is is this was the coolest song in 1986 for me. This compelled me like no other song. I don't wow. know. I don't know why it, it was cooler than In Excess. It was cooler than. Van Halen, it was the coolest thing that I'd ever heard. The first time I heard this song, I could not get enough of it. I played it over and over and over again. That's great. I love that. <laughs> I love that because I totally agree. I love it's totally oh. agree because there's there are because there are pieces of, it's just he, he takes you like we talked about this on Rad, I was like, it's bah this is what I'm talking about. Like when like these guys, these players from back, like they, they just knew how to take you on a little bit of a journey. Yes. And this song has so many different peaks and valleys and melodies built mm-hmm. into it, but built into it, it like seamlessly. It's just what, what you go through, through this song is like, uh, na, 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 na. and then he's like, wah, wah. he's kind of like, but then he's it's like, already, uh. it's just like, you're all over the place and you're kind of like in this mishmash of um, um, emotional throw mm. with it. That is like, it, it, that's, that's what you look for in music in a song. Yeah. The the thing that really compelled me about this song was um, the verses and the way that he delivers the lines kind of outside, like he's kind of stepping outside the lines. You know, there's always structure, right? And the rhyming couplet, but he just throws all that into the wind. He's just talking and he's telling the story. And Roth has this power as a raconteur, a storyteller, like no one else does, you know? And he, he, he holds you there in place while he's telling you the story. And you're just like, tell me more about these two characters, you know? And this guy like disappears at the seven 11. And it's just like, it's the coolest thing I'd ever heard. There was nothing more cool in 1986 than this for Brad Jensen. <laughs> it's kind of funny that contrast day. Eh? It's like, you could either, you could, you know he's kind of a funny showman guy, right? That you could kind of just write off as somebody who's just a funny showman right. guy. Schmaltzy. And then next thing you know, he's doing a song like this. And, like, you know, as you said before, you're leaning in. You're kind of like he, like he's able to get your attention like this. It's like you might think it's a joke. You might think he's funny. But next – like he – but because he's – built that relationship with you almost as a listener you you're compelled to still like lean in and listen to right. a song like that 
Yeah. I, I was hanging on every word. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believed it. Like I, mm-hmm. and that's one of the, the, the most kind of powerful things you can say about eighties music is if you say that you believed it, it validates mm. the entire thing because a lot of eighties music was just bullshit. Like it was ridiculous, you mm-hmm. know, but Roth mm-hmm. just kind of grabbed me in, with this song. That sounds extremely unusual. I know, but yeah. I was his for the taking man. When I heard this song, I listened to it over and over and over again. <laughs> Yeah, I could see that, man. I could see this being that song. So after this, unfortunately, (laughs) the number nine. Bump and grind. Kind of a number nine for me. I like the breakdown of the song after the solo. That's a cool part. What does he say? Did you ever study dancing or do you make it up as you go? So you can see him like trying these lines on women, right? So again, there's kind of that goofy clowniness. But then he's very clever and he's like, women could not resist this guy for that reason. Right. Cause he's this charismatic, like, do you know what I mean? You're like, Oh, give us more. Give us more. Diamond Dave, man. Nobody like him. There was nobody like him. The wedding singer, you, you know, the movie, the wedding singer, Adam it's Sandler. Adam Sandler. Yeah. He, uh, near the end of the movie, he gets, he, he gets drunk and his ex-girlfriend shows up and, they end up having a night together and he wakes up and he can't remember. He doesn't remember that she's there. Mm. And uh, she, she comes walking out and she's wearing a Van Halen t-shirt and he nice. looks <laughs> and he looks at her and he's like, he's like, what are you doing here? She's like, well, I just thought we, you know, whatever, come back and blah. He's like, he's like, no, he's like, get out of my house and take off my Van Halen t-shirt before <laughs> you jinx the band and they break up. <laughs> Please get out of my Van Halen t-shirt before you jinx the band and they break up. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's great. That's so awesome. Uh, I don't know where I was going with that. It was just a funny story. Uh, that's life. Wraps it up. It's mm-hmm. cool. Great it ending. Kills it. Makes yeah. sense. Great way to Everything wrap up. Everything about this record. album makes sense for me. Like, I'm, I'm not big into Bump and Grind. I'm not big into Shy Boy. Mm-hmm. What was the other? One? I think yeah, Elephant Gun was okay, but like, it just everything still felt right. <laughs> it just all felt right in the world. <laughs> you, you 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 know, this is a great kind of reminder that Roth is is the master of ceremonies on this record, right? And it's it's kind of like a an event, and he takes you through that event, yeah, with style, you know. And this yep. is the end, and he's like, ta da, <laughs> right? And you're. <laughs> I just gave you 5,150 reasons to love this album. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, man. I love Diamond Dave. Truly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Uh, what do you think of the record? Yeah, it's good. It's four and a half. It's not quite quite perfect. It's not quite quite perfect. Where'd you drop the point five? um, Well, it's like those three songs. They're just like, Mm. they're just not like my favorite so i'm taking a few points off of there um but the other songs are so good just the whole attitude and feeling and emotion of the album like you just can't you can't deny how it feels so it's 4.5 yeah this is such a great summertime record yeah Oh. oh yeah yeah i still listen to it today regularly in on cassette you play the cassette? Oh, yeah, I do. On my, yeah. I just sit on my, I just sit in the corner with my Walkman <laughs> and listen to it. Big trouble, over and yeah, over uh, and over again. Yeah. Uh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I believe it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, where do we go from here? Dare we do something a little bit different? Oh, okay. I um, I'm thinking about Van Halen now, and I'm thinking about David Lee Roth and that kind of Van Halen, um, just that that nexus between him and, and Edward. Mm. Uh, we already covered all the Roth records, but there is one that we haven't touched, okay. and it's called A Different Kind of Truth. Okay. So this is an album that came out much later, and it is largely. 
um, uh, comprised of songs that were written previous that were just kind of left over from mm. the Roth era Van Halen days. There's a lot of them mm. on the record. Not not all of them are that, but there are a number of those on there. And so maybe we should have a look at that. What do you think? Lead the way. Let's do it. <laughs> Lead the way, Master Jedi. Yeah, I think that would be kind of fun. Cool. Yeah. Different kind of truth. And then okay. maybe we'll do like one more 80s record. And I think I know what that is. It's not going to be Poison. But Okay. No. Okay. No. And then, sure. uh, and then, and then we're going to go into something else that's a surprise. Oh, mm -hmm. surprise! Okay, cool. A surprise. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to be the '90s, is it? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> wait and see. Okay, wait and see. I get wait it. I get it. Okay, wait and, see. wait and see. Right on, man. Be patient. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Crank. Oh yeah, a little higher. A little higher. A little higher. A little higher. There we go. There you go. Wow. Why is his face like that though? Why is he? What's he doing? He's kind of got like, like that what? Suzanne Summers thing going on. Oh, is that what that is? I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Kerrang! Did you ever say kerrang like in a funny way? Just like every time you like got to make it, just get a kerrang. It's like. <laughs> can't help but say it like it's a sound effect every time. Kerrang. I would have tried to explain it to people and they're like, why is it called kerrang? What does that mean? Yeah. You, do you know what, what it does means? does it mean? No. A guitar. It's supposed to be a, like a chord. Like a guitar kerrang. chord being like struck. Like krang. Yeah. Wow. Who, who struck the chord? A three-year-old? I don't know. Okay. Man. Got it. <laughs> I didn't come up with the name, man. Okay. I'm just the messenger. I'm just yeah. telling the story. I just read the magazines. Spread the I would have called it something else, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Not crank. Yeah, what, like Guitar World? No. Cool. That's good, too. It's good you didn't do that. What about Rolling Stone? Maybe. Would that get That doesn't have any legs. That would go nowhere. No, it would never work. That would never work. No. That would never, never work. work. Yeah. It's almost like... If you were to run something like that, your name would have to be Jan. Or Jan. <laughs> it's pronounced Jan. <laughs> Cover your mouth. <laughs> uh, see you next week, Brett. All right, brother. <laughs>